Abort mission! Abort mission! Sorry, turns out uh, I wanted to do something totally different today. I wanted to try an interactive lecture with Blackboard Collaborate Ultra. I came into City College early today because I thought there was going to be a workshop on it. Turns out that workshop was canceled last minute, at least the in-person version. So I stayed at City College, attended the meeting on Zoom, and it didn't look so bad. It's, it's still going to be a lot more annoying than it would be to just record a lecture or have an in-person class. But Blackboard Collaboration Ultra didn't seem that bad from uh, what was being demonstrated. Uh, it was pretty easy from, from what I could see. Um, not easier than just teaching a regular class, but easy. Um, however, I tried to get it to work on my laptop and kind of concurrently record this while having Blackboard Collaboration Ultra streaming live and I could answer questions in real time. However, I got this infinite loop uh, it just, it wouldn't load. It wouldn't load on my laptop. So I don't know what the issue is, if it's an issue with my laptop or it's an issue with the Wi-Fi. Otherwise, my laptop seems fine. So I really don't know. It's probably, I don't know. I don't know. And I'm using Chrome uh, web browser, which was recommended. So I, I really don't know. I spent like half an hour trying to get this thing to work, logging in, logging out, fixing stuff, clearing cache. Uh, it, it just wouldn't work. It, uh, so, I think for now, I'm going to try again tomorrow, see what happens. I might go to a different campus where the Wi-Fi is faster and see if it's just a slow connection thing. Um, but for now, I think I'll just default to my original plan. I'll record a lecture and um, I'll ask for questions if there are any in the usual way, or either drop them in the comment section down below, or if you want it to be a little bit more anonymous to the other viewers, you can email me directly uh, through Jupiter Grades. Don't email me at my college email uh, because uh, things are just crazy and I'm getting many emails per day, just updates on the situation, which as you all know, in-person classes are canceled because of the Corona virus. So, um, we are going to continue. Um, no rest for the weary. We're just gonna stay out here, keep hustling, keep grinding, we out here. Um, stuff has to be learned. Nonetheless, the world is not gonna stop spinning. Uh, these were the examples from uh, last time. They're not going to be that bad, or they shouldn't be that bad. Uh, and uh, so we're gonna really knock these out very quickly and talk about uh, the rest of the series tests. And, um, move on from there. I will keep you guys posted as far as I can tell. And because of my experience with Collaboration Ultra, I'll probably default to Zoom or something else for office hours. We'll see. Um, by the way, I haven't used Blackboard in a long time. I tried to use Blackboard like the, my first semester teaching, you know, being a real greenhorn. But I've always had issues with it, like uh, memory and cache issues, and I'll be posting stuff and it, it'll run out of memory on me, cause it, and, and now the Collaboration Ultra won't load, so I don't know, maybe it's just me, maybe I'm a, I have bad luck with Blackboard, but uh, it's never been my thing, um, and I really don't use it very often. Um, so I'll try again tomorrow, but for now the show must go on. Uh, if you are in my... RS2 section of this class. Uh, the G8 section, which I'm currently recording for, is behind because of uh, holidays that happened. So this is gonna be a repeat. Uh, everything here was pre-recorded. I think what I'm actually going to do, just to give you guys a heads up, is maybe record an extra half a lecture at another day for the G8 section to get both classes at the same point and I'll actually only do one recording from there on out. And what I would do is hopefully get something like Blackboard Collaboration Ultra to work, if not Blackboard Collaboration Ultra. And what I would do is I would simply just replay my first recording for the next class 
and just answer questions real time. That seems to be doable and it just, it works out better because, you know, you guys are probably home in your pajamas, but uh, to have a nice space and have a nice blackboard for you all, I'm still traveling back and forth uh, to college and yeah, I would like to stay home at least half the time. I'd still log in and talk with you guys during the time of class, but um, other than that, I'd rather want to have the freedom of being in another location, just like how you guys have. So yeah, I'll probably be posting towards the end of this week, just an extra half lecture on the GS section, get both of you guys at the same spot and start recordings on maybe Monday, Wednesday for the GH section, and I would replay those recordings on Tuesday, Thursday, while having some sort of video conference with the second class. So if the second class has any questions that the first class didn't have, I can deal with them. Uh, office hours likely through Zoom. Um, I think City College is working on a corporate account when it comes to Zoom and I'll probably hold office hours through then. So I probably won't hold office hours until my office hours on Thursday. Yeah, other than that, I'm gonna keep recording. I'll try it again, as I said, get Blackboard Collaboration Ultra to work tomorrow. Um, for now, let's just, let's just continue. I'm, I'm, I'm really like tired because of just the frustration of trying to get this thing to work. But let's go. Uh, so last time I introduced the P-series test to you guys. And just so right, another thing that happened today, another thing. Uh, I'm gonna be writing with yellow chalk because my other class knows this, but I, I use fancy chalk. Hagoromo, uh, because it's the best chalk around. It's just, like, that's an objective fact. And I ran out of the white ones. I mean, I have some, but they're very short and I don't like writing with short chalk. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start writing with yellow chalk because I ran out. I was gonna say it's because, oh, studies have shown that yellow chalk, uh, it's not, no. I'm only writing with yellow chalk because I'm running out of white ones. When I came into City College today, to attend that workshop that ends up not being in person at all. A whole shipment of these came to my house and I missed the shipment because I was here. So I'll write with these. I'll try to pick up the shipment from uh, the post office tomorrow. And yeah, let's go with the P-series test. The P-series test, let me just remind you of what that was. Uh, this was a test that says this is for a series of the form 1 over n to the p, and goes from 1 to infinity. Uh, p is a constant. This guy is called a p series. Um, and so now it turns out that through the integral test, the integral test implied that this guy will converge whenever the integral 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p converge. We showed that converges if and only if p is greater than 1 in a previous lecture. So this means uh, we have convergence. if and only if p is larger than 1. Um, so anything that you can, any series that you can write in this form, uh, all you have to do is check that p is uh, larger than 1 and you will know that it converges. That's pretty much it. Um, so I left you guys with a few examples. We didn't actually write them out, uh, but let's just knock them out quickly. And as I was Tell my other class, it is going to behoove you to actually, even though I'm not there to force you to work, to actually try these guys on your own. What I would do, say now, is that you would pause the video and that you would try all these problems. And it shouldn't take you more than four minutes, actually. Like, if it takes you more than four minutes, uh, that's, that's actually not great. Uh, try this, pause the video, set a clock timer for four minutes, do all these problems. You should probably finish in half that time. Uh, but yeah, do that. Pause the video. Pause it. Pause it.
Okay, good. Are you back? Did you try the problems? If not, pause it. Go back, try the problems. Okay, good. Let me check, is the lens clean here? Hmm. Okay, so that's all there is to it. Uh, the P-series test directly is not gonna be a difficult test to apply. Um, I'm gonna talk about why the P-series test is useful in general. It's not useful directly because I'm never gonna ask you a question like this on an actual test or an exam in whatever form that's gonna take in the coming uh, weeks. But it's useful for another reason, I'll mention that. So A, This is a series that you should already know whether it converges or diverges. That was the question for all of these. Do these converge or diverge? You should know the answer to this one. That is a very famous series that I mentioned before. You all know that it, that's right, it diverges uh, because it is the harmonic series. It diverges, we know this diverges. Another way you can look at it, it is actually a P-series. This means divergence by P-series test. Right? So you could just say, in general, hey, this guy diverges because he's the harmonic series, and that is a reason. I will accept that as reason. Another option is to say, hey, this is a p-series, so p equals one. Um, it's, p is not greater than one, so it's going to uh, diverge. B. Now here, this converges or diverges? Three seconds to answer. That's right, converges. This is a convergent P series. P equals two. In fact, we know what the answer is here. You don't really need to know, but just for fun, I mentioned that this was pi squared over six. And yeah, that's pi squared over six. Okay, uh, let's do the uh, one over radical N. Sometimes when it's understood who the variable for the series is, you'll just notice that I'll write the number here. Instead of writing n equals one, I just might write one. Uh, it's customary to be sloppy in this way. Sometimes, you know, writing it gets annoying. Um, so, uh, tell me about this one. Uh, converges or diverges? That's right, it uh, diverges. How do we know? Well, I can write this as n equals one half. This means it's a p-series with p equals one half, which is less than one. This means it diverges. This one converges or diverges. Tell me before I write it down. That is probably how you want to approach that first. And notice here, it's P series with P equals 11 over 10, which is larger than one. Series converges. You can write by P series test. So those weren't that bad. So here's the thing with P-series. It's very rare that I'm gonna ask you a problem or you're gonna see a problem if you're doing a departmental final, which this section isn't. 
But I'm not going to ask you a problem that's directly a P-series because it's kind of silly as you can see. Where P-series come in handy is with the next few tests that I'm going to give you um, is that uh, they're useful in comparison. So normally when we want to come, we're going to have comparison tests for series. Normally when you want to compare a series to something else to determine convergence or divergence, a P-series is a nice guy to compare to because it's easy to tell whether they converge or diverge. So P-series directly, you're not going to be tested on it, but it's something you need to know because they're useful in comparison. And I'm going to tell you which comparisons are useful with P-series. Okay. Um, so you can take some time, copy those down. Okay, that's enough time. Uh, so we're going to continue on this journey. We're going to talk about more series tests. So that was the P-series test, which is directly implied by the integral test, which I also introduced last class. Um, let's talk about some other tests that are also kind of follow immediately from the integral test, or very easily they follow from the integral test. The integral test. And the comparison theorems. for improper integrals. So remember those guys, we did two comparison theorems for improper integrals. We did the direct comparison theorem and the limit comparison theorem. And we learned how to compare two improper integrals to determine whether one converges or diverges based on you knowing what happens to the other one. Um, it turns out there are analogous theorems for series um, and which is implied by the integral test itself, where, where the integral test itself is about using an improper integral to talk about what happens to a series. So in the same way, we can have uh, analogous versions of the comparison theorems that apply to series. And so the integral test, which tells you that we're allowed to apply what we know about improper integrals to series in a very specific way, also imply with the comparison theorems that we can make certain generalizations to series. So they imply the following two tests. One is the comparison test. Okay. Now, of course, sometimes it's called a direct comparison test. Um, you might see the word direct here, but not always. Um, it's OK to actually leave out the word direct here. It's very traditional to do that. Um, so here's what it says. Uh, if we have two sequences who line up this way. So uh, the outputs of one sequence is always greater than or equal to zero. The outputs of another sequence is always larger than or equal to the outputs of the first sequence. Then it turns out that series will obey inequalities. That actually should make a lot of sense to you. Um, because here we're adding up things, right? So here we're adding up numbers that are, each of them are bigger than this number, so the sum over here should be bigger than the sum over there. That should make a lot of sense. So if you have sequences that behave in this way, the corresponding series will also maintain that inequality relationship. And we have the analogous conclusions from the direct comparison test. Namely, if Bn converges, then a n converges. And if a n diverges, then b n diverges. And no conclusion in other scenarios. And 
again, this should make a lot of sense. This should, this feels very intuitive to me. Hopefully, it is very intuitive to you. Um, but these guys are both positive, so that when you start adding, there is some accumulation that's going to happen. So, if we know that the accumulation stops at a number for the larger guy, then the accumulation must stop at a number for the smaller guy as well. Um, so, if this BN stops at a number, A and is forced to stop at a number because he always has to be less than or equal to that guy. Um, if, on the contrary, A and diverges, and of course, if A and diverges in this case, it is going to diverge to infinity because my A ends are positive numbers. I keep adding positive numbers. They're not going to bounce up and down. They're not going to oscillate. They're not going to cancel each other out. I'm just adding up a bunch of things. And so, if that guy diverges, diverges off to infinity. So we have infinity, and this guy's greater than or equal to that. He must also diverge to infinity. Um, of course, other cases you can make any conclusion. If A n converges, you cannot make any conclusion about B n because this guy could diverge to infinity. He could also not, and both will be equally true. If B n diverges, you cannot make any conclusion about A n because A n could diverge as well, or he could converge. You can't actually tell. So that's the comparison test, right? So normally when we use the word test, uh, the implication is that we're talking about series. If we say comparison theorem, chances are we're talking about improper integrals. But they're, they're really, they really go hand in hand according to the integral test. Uh, let's actually do an example. sense of it and take a stab at this problem. Pause the video, uh, take two minutes, three minutes and do it and yes I know I'm not there to force you to do it but do it. It's going to be better for you in the long run. As I think I mentioned on the other video um, and I'll let you pause in a bit but just so you know um, I mentioned in the other video as well that there are a lot of times where students they really come up with the wrong reasons for why things are the way they are so they'll, they'll see a student who's good at math or who's always answering questions in class and they're always getting it correct and all of that and they'll assume that oh that person is just naturally a math person you know I'm, I'm not a math person blah 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 and I'm not saying that there aren't geniuses out there but they're actually a lot rarer than people think. Um, there are very, very, very few people who just wake up in the morning, does not even trying, and they're just awesome at mathematics at every level. Like you don't, and I, and I think there comes a point uh, where that's not true for anybody. Uh, so a lot of times when you see people performing better, you see students getting A's. It's not that they're smarter than you. It's not that they have a higher IQ. They just have very simple habits that you don't have and essentially they're outworking you. So there is the student who's going to watch this video and even every time after I ask them to pause the video and try the problem, they're not going to do it. There's the, another kind of student who is going to pause the video and they're actually going to try the problem when I ask them to try it. And on average, the second type of student is going to do better. The difference between getting an A, doing very well and not getting an A or doing very poorly is going to be very small habits like that. Um, you need to try for yourself. You need to actually attempt problems on your own. Watching me do a problem is not going to be of good value to you if you don't know what you on your own are capable of. So you really need to pause it. And even if you try and you get stuck or you try it and you get the wrong answer, 
first of all, it's now long distance, so no one has to know about you. It's our little secret, right? Even if you get stuck, even if you get the wrong answer, even if you totally don't know what's going on, you are going to now have data on what exactly is getting you stuck, what exactly don't you understand, at what step did you not get it, right? You are going to learn about yourself as opposed to, as, as in, in the sense of, you know where you are, you know what you understand. And even if you need to go and get help from someone or ask me a question, you would be able to go with the knowledge of saying, oh, here's specifically what I have problems with, as opposed to what often happens when anyone goes to me or a tutor and I ask, oh, so what are you having trouble with? Oh, I don't understand anything. Doesn't help anybody, okay? You need to know what you don't understand. It makes the learning process a lot easier. It gets you to focus in on what re what's really important. And one of the only ways to actually get that data is to actually do problems on your own. Um, so it's very important and quite frankly every time I give you a piece of advice it's very important uh, because one of the things what, that I want to do when teaching I don't just do this just to get a paycheck and go home and just say I did my job I told them what I had to tell them I want my students to be better than all the other students I give you advice not just so you can pass the class, but so you can master the class, so you can dominate it, so that you are better than every other Calc 2 student. And I, I really want that for my people. So, what I'm going, anytime I give you advice, it is really important. It comes from a lot of experience, not only my own experience, but a lot of my students' experiences. And really, it's just really important that whenever I tell you to do something, it might seem simple, it might not seem like a big deal to you, and I fully understand that. But I want the best for you, so just trust me, try it, you will see that it will end you up in a better position anyway. So again, sorry for that rant, again, I already, I already started the lecture with a rant, here's another one, but please, whenever I ask you to do, pause the video and try the problem, you need to pause the video and try the problem. It's very, very important. You can't believe how important it is. It's really important. So pause the video, try the problem, you can take two, three minutes, max. If you're not getting it in three minutes, stop, try, start the video again. Okay, pause. Okay, let's go. Hopefully you actually attempted this problem. Let's actually get on with it. Um, so I don't have anyone here to quiz on whether they understand. So hopefully you're following my advice. Every now and then I'll do this until we get a uh, Blackboard Collaboration Ultra or something similar up and running, I have no way to interact with you guys, so I'm really just gonna pause at certain locations and ask you to give input. And hopefully you're actually doing that. Okay, so uh, what do you guys think? Uh, it was using the comparison theorem, so we're definitely gonna wanna compare it to something. What do you think is a good thing to compare it to? What was your first step? What did you compare it to? Okay, so now what I'm hoping you said is that, well, I know that as we're going off to infinity, the smaller guys don't matter, so that guy is a pretty nice guy to compare it to. Uh, and so, you know what? I would agree. I concur. Look at this series. Um, well, I can't start k equal zero. Uh, however, uh, I can start it at one. And I can notice that I can evaluate the first term of this, plug in k equals zero. I would actually get zero as the answer. Right? So this guy here is actually equal to uh, It's equivalent to uh, having the series start off at zero, even though I want to start at one. There's no real way to actually write that down, actually, so I don't know why I was doing that. Right? So, in fact, this series I could say was actually equal to if k equals one. It's equivalent to saying k equals one. Because if my k equals zero, it just gives me zero. Um, so I don't have to worry about division by zero. Now, question. How does this series compare to that series? And it is 
larger. That is correct. How do I know? Because the denominator is smaller. I made a smaller denominator, so I get a larger fraction. So we have this is true. Um, it is also true that this guy is larger than or equal to 0 because I'm only plugging in positive values for k and it's under a radical and everything is nice and positive. Now, what can you tell me about this series? That's right, it is a p-series. So this is equal to, well I can factor out the 3 over radical 2 and this is going to be k over k to the 5 over 2. Now, what you'll notice about k over that, I can simplify this by saying it's k to the 1 minus 5 over 2 in the power. So this is 2 over 2 minus 5 over 2, you get minus 3 over 2. Or in other words, this is 1 over k to the 3 over 2. So this guy is a p-series, right? So again, the problem didn't start off being a p-series, but I compared it to something that's a p-series. Now I know about this guy. Uh, this is a convergent p-series. Your p equals 3 over 2, which is larger than 1. And so what you can say here, the original series, converges by comparison. So hopefully that's the answer you got. You got that it com converged. And hopefully your answer was similar in terms of the steps that you laid out, was similar to the steps that I laid out here. Because for, for this kind of problem, this is actually one of the more efficient ways to do it. Um, it's not the only way to do this problem, but chances are if you tried something else, it was less efficient than this way. Um, so yeah, that's uh, the comparison theorem. And now you can see where a p-series might come in handy. So these guys in and of themselves, they're too simple for me to ask you a question directly about them, but they can pop up in other scenarios most, most notably in comparison scenarios where you can use them to compare to other guys and thereby come up with a conclusion. Let's move on to another, uh, so get out of the way, copy those, pause the video, I'll give you guys three seconds, three, two, one. Okay, hopefully you pause the video at this point to copy that down, we're moving on. So uh, the next guy is analogous to our other comparison test. So what I want to talk about now is the limit comparison test. And just to remind you when this test was useful in the improper integral scenario, what if we don't know how the inequalities turn if a n is greater than or equal to b n or bn is greater than less than is greater than or equal to an. Right? So for the direct comparison test, we have to know how the series compare to each other. We have to know how who is bigger than who. Uh, so that if the larger one converges, we know the smaller one converges, and if the smaller one diverges, we know the larger one diverges. So um, what if we don't have that data? Or we could find that data, but we just don't want to because it's going to be very annoying. Uh, then we move on to something called the limit comparison test. Now, they, we usually don't leave out the word limit here. 
if someone just says comparison test, they're talking about the direct comparison test. Um, but if someone is using the limit comparison test, they'll mention limit comparison test. They'll say either limit comparison or limit comparison test. So here's how this test works. The only thing you require is that your sequences are positive. You don't want them to be equal to zero because what we're going to do is you're going to uh, take a ratio. So assuming that we're always getting positive outputs from our guys, then if the limit, of course, as n goes to infinity of a n over b n equals L, where L greater than zero is a real number, then the infinite series a n and b n both converge or both diverge. In other words, they do the same thing. And this is nice in the sense that if you know about one of them, if you know either what BN does or AN does, and this check works out, then you'll automatically know about the other one. Now, as is very common, as I implied with the last comparison test, oftentimes the other series that you're going to know about is a P-series. So you're going to find a p-series to compare it to the original series. It doesn't always have to be a p-series, but it's very common in a Calc 2 class. Uh, so if you know about that series, it's going to be something easy like a p-series, or maybe sometimes a geometric series that you know about. Um, if one converges or diverges and you know that, and you take this limit and you end up with a positive real number, then the other one is also going to converge or it's going to diverge, respectively. They will both do the same thing. This is called the limit comparison test. You can notice how very uh, this is very analogous to our limit comparison theorem for improper integrals. You can pause the video and flip back in your notebook and read that theorem, and you realize it's exactly what was going on if we're talking about improper integrals here. Um, so that is the limit comparison test. And again, here I'm not emphasizing what series, what are, what is the starting and end point, because we're always just going to assume that we're dealing with infinite series here. The finite series aren't very aren't very uh, interesting for us. Okay, uh, let's do an example. It's going to be a silly example, but let's do it nonetheless. So, converge or diverge. solution to this, two minutes, three minutes, not more than three minutes. If you're taking longer than three minutes, then you definitely don't understand what's going on. Um, that's going to be the thing with this, is each individual series test, they're not going to be difficult to apply on their own. Uh, what's going to be the challenge with this problem is kind of the same as the challenge with integrals. When I give you a bunch of them, and I don't give you any direction on what test you should be trying, you having to look at them and figure out what test you want to try, and then actually applying it, that's where the, uh, the difficulty is going to come in. But each test individually, for any one series, especially when I tell you what test you're supposed to be using, it shouldn't be very difficult for you to actually get to the solution. Two to three minutes, max, right? Um, so, uh, pause the video, try that example. Give you a countdown to pause. Three, two, one. And we're back. Okay, so hopefully you actually pause the video and actually try this. Let's actually see what the solution would look like. Now, again, you might have the thought, which would be a very good thought. It means you're well mathematically trained. Um, to just, you know what? The larger guys are going to control the picture here. Um, so, you might want to just compare this guy to 
a series of n over n squared, which you know is equal to the series of 1 over n. From n goes from 3 to infinity. Now, uh, there's a, another thing I want to mention here, but remind me. Um, now, what you will notice here is that you made both the numerator and the denominator smaller. So, what happens is, we made the numerator smaller. This means we have a smaller fraction. Uh, but we also made the denominator smaller. This means we get a larger fraction. Now one might be able to come up with arguments who is larger or bigger for sure, but off the top of my head, I'm not going to see a way that can describe which one here is bigger or smaller. Um, one thing you want to notice here is that we made changes that both led to a smaller fraction in one instance and a larger fraction in the other instance. Who knows who wins out? Is the smaller amount that I made it by smaller than the larger amount that I made it by? Like you don't know and you don't want to have to waste time trying to figure that out who's smaller or who's larger. So rather than actually doing a direct comparison, um, I would actually do a limit comparison test because it's not clear, at least not at face value. And again, we should be taking two or three minutes on these the most. That includes writing down time, not figuring out time. Um, so I don't want to spend a long time dealing with other issues that I shouldn't have to be dealing with. So what I'm going to do is not figure out who is larger or smaller, but rather just take a limit. So what's going to happen here is if I set a n to be the original guy. Set my b n to be 1 over n, which by the way, we know what b n does. It's the harmonic series, so we know that diagram What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take a limit. divided by bn being 1, which is greater than 0, which means the limit comparison test implies that they both do the same thing. So this guy diverges, and you would say by limit comparison. How do I know? Because I know that bn diverges, because it's harmonic. Now, the thing that I wanted to mention, now hopefully you got something similar to that. If not, you have questions, send me a message or drop them down in the comment section. But hopefully you got an, an answer that looked very similar to that. Now, a question that I got from my class the last time, this was actually the last in-person class that we did, was someone asked, how do you know that's harmonic? Because it doesn't actually, am I pointing at the right thing? How do we know that that's harmonic? Because it doesn't actually fit the strict definition, right? You told us harmonic means it starts from 1 to infinity. Now, there are a couple ways you can know that any guy that looks like this, if it's 1 over a linear polynomial, it's going to behave harmonic. Uh, so this is just a side note here. But it's something worth mentioning because there, there are little nuances. Some of you might not even be bothered by it, but it's probably not great that you're not bothered by it um, because definitions and the nuances are important and we, we saw some examples of this where we got in trouble by not noticing it like when we were doing those geometric series examples um, right knowing that it's a geometric series if the first input is 0 versus the first input is 1 algebraically things work out very differently right your a value will change it depending on uh, what you're looking at so Knowing they sing the little things, uh, it's going to be important. So one thing I do want to mention here is that 
uh, n equals 3 to infinity of 1 over n is harmonic. Now, there are a couple ways that we can see that. Um, one is to notice that if you look at 1 over n from 1 to infinity, that's just 1 plus a half plus a third plus a fourth plus a fifth plus a third up. What you'll notice is that from this point on is where this guy comes in. So the harmonic series is actually just this constant plus that series. Now, we know that the harmonic series adds up to infinity. So if this is infinity, and essentially what this guy is, is just the harmonic series. So 1 over n, n starts from 3 to infinity, is really just the harmonic series. And subtracting 1, subtracting a half. But we know that this guy adds up to infinity. So if I subtract 1 and a half, it still adds up to infinity. It has the same exact behavior as a harmonic series. And so what you can actually also notice is that you could have done a shift. We're not going to really do much of this in this class, but in a class like 391, you'll do this a lot, is you can actually write this guy as just another variable. which might convince some of you that it's harmonic. If you want, if you really wanted it to start at 1, you could have just set k equals uh, something like n minus 2. So then when my n is 3, that will hit 1. And so this series, I, I can look at it as something that's starting from 1 of 1 over a linear function. So I have a k plus 2 here instead of a 1 over n. But you can see that that's growing linearly one step at a time. And it has the start point at 1. It's just a little side note. So pretty much anything here. series that you have looking like a n plus b and goes from 1 to infinity a not equals 0 can be thought of as harmonic. Because the, 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 the behavior is similar enough to a harmonic series. Let's and you can always just set k equals this guy, so you have that 1 over k, and then an argument similar to over here tells you that it's going to diverge, because it has a harmonic behavior. Okay, let's actually see what happens. And we, we, another way to know that that guy is always going to diverge is Again, a limit comparison test. Compare it to the harmonic series. And if your A is well, if your A is positive, it, you can apply it directly. Well, if your A is negative, you can just factor out the A and then look at the series on the inside because we have a property that says we can do that. And you'll actually get the limit being one if you plug in uh, the limit ratio. OK. I'm really tired. I'm rambling a lot tonight. Okay, let's actually go. Uh, but that's the limit comparison test. Hopefully you tried that example and it went okay. Lots more tests to get through. Well, not a lot, but I forgot to even number them. What, what number are we up to? So that was the limit comparison test. The next test I want to talk about is something called the alternating series test. Okay, so 
So what have we covered so far? So we covered a test for telescoping series, which was test zero. Do I have all the list here? Okay, yeah, so telescoping series test zero. Test for divergence was test one. Geometric series test was test two. Integral test was test three. P series test is test four. Direct comparison test, test five. Limit comparison test, test six. So the alternating series test, this is test number seven. Uh, first, I need to tell you what an alternating series is. Uh, so, uh, ba -ba 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 suppose a n is always positive, then the series that looks like the following minus one to the n a n is called an alternating series. And this, it doesn't matter where it starts out, but n equals one or zero going off to infinity, whatever. Um, it's called an alternating series. It's so called because of the alternating signs. You'll notice that if you were to list out what this guy would look like, if I started it at 1, for example, it would look like minus a1 plus a2 minus a3 plus a4 minus a5, etc. Signs are alternating every time. Because my a is always positive, I'm not going to have like a negative doubling up with a negative or a positive interfering with a positive. So I get a string of negatives or a string of positives. Um, the sign will alternate after every term. That's called an alternating series. So it's worth mentioning that they don't have to exactly look like this. Like if I made this a n plus 1, it would still be alternating. Um, uh, there are other things that won't make it alternating. So if this were 2n, it's not alternating anymore. But it should be clear to you that anything that has an alternating sign, which is very commonly represented by like a minus 1 to the n, or minus 1 to the n plus 1, or something similar to that, um, is going to be what you consider an alternating series. The name comes from the alternating sign. This is a very common way to in indicate an alternating sign. This is something I mentioned a long time ago, by the way. We spoke, we looked at this guy as a sequence and showed that it actually diverged. But uh, yeah, so this is an alternating series. It turns out we have a test for these guys. So sometimes I abbreviate the alt series test. So you have this guy that looks like this. How do you know whether it converges or not? Um, turns out that there's a test you can do that goes the following. Uh, Infinite series, of course, is not going to be a finite series. If here are the three situations, a n is decreasing, right? And we know what decreasing means. This means uh, the strict definition is a n plus one is larger than is smaller than or equal to a n. Or, if it's something that's differentiable and you know a nice derivative formula for it, it means that a n prime is less than zero. So it has to be decreasing. That's one of the situations. Uh, it has to, of course, be positive, a n positive. And the third situation, the 
is the limit a n equals zero. If you have an alternating series and these three conditions are fulfilled, right? I mean, this has to be fulfilled anyway if it's an alternating series. It turns out then the series converges. And by the way, it's okay for something to be eventually decreasing, right? Meaning, in the beginning, it could have haphazard behavior, it could bounce up and down, but eventually there comes a point where every term is smaller than the previous term. Once you have that behavior, and these other two conditions are fulfilled, it turns out that you're looking at a convergent uh, series. This is called the alternating series test. Um, it only applies to alternating series. As I mentioned before, if you only look at the limit being zero, it is not enough information to determine if a series is convergent. The opposite of the test for divergence does, isn't true. However, if you have alternating signs and you're decreasing, then the limit actually does tell you about convergence. Something that you do want to note here is that you only have this being true because of the alternating sign and specifically this test will only tell you about conditional convergence because if you put absolute values around everybody, then if you follow this test, all that's going to do is like you applying the test for divergence on some random positive series, which we know doesn't actually work out. Um, so the test will only give you conditional convergence, meaning there will come a point where I'm going to ask you about absolute convergence. If I ask you about absolute convergence, you cannot use the alternating series test. Uh, the alternating series test will only tell you about conditional convergence. and I explained to you the importance of conditional versus absolute convergence before. Absolute convergence means it converges if I put absolute values around all the terms. Conditional convergence means it does not converge if I put all absolute values around the terms, but without doing that, it converges. And alternating series tests are very common to, sh it's very common that an alternating series test will show this behavior. So in the alternating version with alternating signs, there are many series that will converge, but if you put absolute values around it so you kill the alternating signs, they no longer converge. So these guys are very commonly conditionally convergent series. Now we're going to talk about some more nuances, but remember the importance here. Alternating series, absolutely convergent series, will converge even if you rearrange the terms. This means that they maintain commutativity of addition. This means Calculus will work in the sense that I can distribute a derivative or I can distribute an integral across an infinite series. That only is true for absolutely convergent series, so it's very important. For conditionally convergent series, it is not true for conditionally convergent series. If you rearrange the terms, you can get different answers. In fact, you can get any answer you want. In fact, you can get the series to diverge. So conditionally convergent series, it's a very thin, delicate, fickle kind of convergence. Absolute convergence is the gold standard. It will converge even if you spin people around. Um, so what you should know about the alternating series test, not only what it says and the fact that it works on alternating series right there, um, but you should also know that it only tells you about conditional convergence. That's going to be important coming up later. After I get through all the tests, we're going to talk about situations where that will be important but just know that. Um, let's do a simple example, because we're going to do more examples coming up. Uh, we're going to do so. How about the alternating harmonic series? Um, so that's the guy that goes minus 1 plus a half third plus a fourth positive.
the video, take a minute, a minute and a half, and tell me whether or not this guy converges. Pause the video, come on, do it. Three, two, one. Okay, goodness, you need pause. Okay, so uh, let's actually see what uh, this guy is doing. So for one, it is definitely alternating signs. So here's what we're going to notice. Um, set a n equals one over n. So our series is now. What do you notice about a n? A n is positive for all n larger than or equal to one. So that should be clear. Second of all, a n is decreasing. Now, for the most part, just mentioning this is going to be enough for me. Like, uh, for something as simple as this, I probably wouldn't expect you to actually write this out. So, since 1 over n plus 1 is going to be large, smaller than or equal to 1 over n, that should actually be clear. Each term is getting smaller than the previous term because the denominator is getting larger. Now, in most instances, if you just mention it's decreasing, I'm going to take your word for it. You don't really have to justify it. Um, unless it's really weird. If it's, if it's totally not clear that the denominator is not, is, that the denominator is overwhelmed with the numerator, I wouldn't say you should justify it. Um, but usually, because we know about the relationship between logarithms and polynomials and exponentials and factorials and all that stuff, usually if you have a ratio of these guys, you'll be able to tell who's going to be bigger and better and if the denominator is eventually going to overwhelm the numerator. But you just mentioning that it's decreasing is going to be good enough for me. That way I know that you thought about it. It wasn't something that you forgot to check. So just mention that it's decreasing 99% of the time. I'll actually just accept that. Um, but of course, if you're wrong and you say something is decreasing when it's not, then I'm going to know you're just trying to pull one over on me. And yeah, it's not going to slide. I'm going to notice. I'm going to be like, no, it's not decreasing. So if you say something is decreasing, make sure it's decreasing. Um, but other than that, you don't really have to justify that too much. This one is, is pretty darn obvious. Also pretty obvious is that the limit of an is zero. So what you can say here one of them converges minus one to the n of over n converges. And you would say here by the alternating series test. So that's something that I also want you to, to mention. So if you, if you tell me that something converges or diverges, I do want you to justify which test you're using and make sure that you identify the fact that all the conditions for the test to give you the conclusion you came to have been satisfied. Um, yeah, so this one actually converges by alternating series test. One thing I want you to notice here is that If I were to take this series and put absolute value there, this is equal to just 1 over n, which diverges. We know that. We have conditional convergence here. Okay. If I 
put absolute values around all the terms, it doesn't converge anymore. Uh, however, if I leave things as is, it converges by the alternating series test. So hopefully so far, things have been going okay. You don't really, uh, you're understanding everything. If you don't understand anything, drop a, drop a question down in the comment section or send me a message to Jupiter Grades. That's the alternating series test. We'll have more examples later on, but just to, just a one-off example so you can kind of see the idea behind the test. Um, this is a pretty, pretty good one, pretty important one. It's actually a very famous example. Um, because we know the, the harmonic series is a very famous divergent example. The alternating harmonic is a very famous convergent alternating example. And it's, it's one of the guys that kind of justify to you that um, the difference between absolute convergent and conditionally convergent in terms of things you can compute. So this is a nice example of a series that converges conditionally. And it's, it's really easy to see. And later on, I don't know, how much time do we have left? Let's check. Okay, we have about uh, 35 minutes or so, if I'm taking the, uh, the normal class time very seriously. Um, so eventually I'm going to actually wrap this all together, so don't be concerned in that regard. Eventually I'm going to put everything in a nice little package. I'm going to give you a strategy for a series. I'm going to tell you, okay, I'm going to tell you like 11 tests at the end of all this, and then I'm gonna tell you, okay, here's how you know to apply which test. What do you kind of look for? Um, because that, that's, that's where the challenge is gonna come in. If I give you a bunch of random series, um, how do you actually uh, figure them out? Let's see, what else do I want to tell you? So we have about three left. Let's do the ratio test. That's a nice one. These examples are going to be nice. I'm actually going to have you guys do these guys, pause, and fully work out a solution for them. And I'll even give you guys four minutes each for this one Let's uh, so you can try those. Um, let's do the ratio test. So this is test number eight, I want to say. is the next guy I want to tell you about. Now here, suppose series A n is such that A n is not equal to zero for all n, right? So, other than that requirement, there is no, strictly speaking, requirement to apply the ratio test. The ratio test can work on a wide variety, or you can think of applying it to a wide variety of, of, of situations. Um, I'm going to tell you some situations where you don't want to apply it later on. But pretty much the only hard and fast rule is that you don't want any of the terms to hit zero at any point. It's okay if some of them are positive and some are negative. It's even okay if it's alternating. Uh, that's not going to be a problem, but you don't want anyone to hit zero and why you're going to see what I'm, why that's important. Set L to be, we're going to take a certain limit, limit as n approaches infinity of the absolute value of a certain ratio, which is why it's called the ratio test, a n plus 1 over so you take the formula for a n, you replace all n's with n plus 1's, then you take the f original formula and you divide by that. Um, and this is why we can't have people hitting 0 because you're actually taking a ratio. You don't want to actually divide by 0 at any point. Uh, so you set that limit. You set L to be this limit. And based on the value of this limit, you are going to make, be able to make certain conclusions. Then. 
here's what you can conclude. If L is less than 1, okay, now your L is definitely going to be either 0 or something larger. Um, because you're taking absolute values of the terms here. Um, so one scenario is if it's less than 1. If it's less than 1, then the series converges. In fact, the ratio test is really nice in this regard. Not only does it tell you about convergence, but because we lead with absolute values here, it tells you about absolute convergence. Convergence absolutely. Pretty nice. I mean, I'm not really proving any of the tests to you. I might talk about the idea behind it, but I'm just stating the test. You should know that this is one of the scenarios you can encounter. The other scenario is if your L is larger than one, then a n diverges See, if your L is equal to 1 which is another possibility uh, no conclusion from this test The idea is the following. Um, pretty much, if the terms in the ratio are such that this fraction is actually smaller than 1, it means that guys that are ahead in the series are actually comparatively smaller than guys that came before. And it turns out, if this ratio is less than 1, it shows that these guys are small enough that it's going to converge. That's kind of the idea. In the sense that you get a limit less than 1. What that means is that guys that are farther along in the series are larger in magnitude than the ones that came before. This kind of means that you're accumulating larger and larger amounts over time, and it diverges in that case. If it's equal to 1, then pretty much it tells you nothing about uh, the ratio, because it just be, it's like, well, the series isn't doing any decreasing or increasing behavior that we can talk about. It's kind of just flatlining, but we don't know if that flatline is still small enough so that they'll converge anyway. Right? So that is called the ratio test. Um, I don't want to waste time on the proof. If you're interested, you can read the, the textbook, but it's, it's not necessary for you to know the proof for that at all. Um, so I'm just going to just going to skip it. So, however, I'll give you some time to copy that, copy the ratio test. Pause the video, three, two, one, copy that down, and let's move on. So that is the ratio test. So here are some examples that I want you to try. To apply, uh, for the ratio test. First example, n equals 1 to infinity, minus 1 to the n, or 2 to the n. So that's the first example. pause the video and I would say um, come with full solutions for both of these guys uh, and I'll give you three to four minutes each problem so try those and uh, let me know what you get pausing the video in three two one okay hopefully you pause it and try it and we're back
So let's actually look at the first one. Here's something that you may have noticed is that uh, this converges by the alt series test. Now, some of you might have thought of using this test, um, and in general, that's fine at this point. We'll talk about situations where you jumping into the alt series test would not be fine. And that, well, I'll tell you now. Um, but we only get conditional convergence here. Now, if you're in a context where that's OK, then you're done. You don't have to do anything, right? But let's just say I required that you show me whether or not it absolutely converges then you doing the alternating series test isn't actually good enough. It can only tell you about conditional convergence. So um, let's uh, apply a different test, namely the ratio test. However, uh, by the ratio test, That guy's never actually going to be uh, zero because my n starts at one. So the ratio test does hold uh, for the requirements. Um, and what we're going to look at is set L equals the limit of a n plus one over a n. That's going to be equal to the limit of Now I'm going, to, I'm going to put these guys in here, but it's not going to matter. Uh, minus 1 to the n plus 1. So I change all n's to the n plus 1. So and what I'm going to do is, yes, technically we're dividing by a n, but you can also think of this as multiplying by the reciprocal, which is nicer to write out. So what I did here was multiply by 1 over a n, as opposed to dividing by a n. They're exactly the same thing. Okay. Now, here is something that I recommend. Um, it's not, strictly speaking, necessary. But by the way, this is going to be minus 1 to the n. Another thing you can notice is that uh, putting in these are optional. You're going to realize that because of the absolute values, even if these guys contribute a negative sign, which they will, it's not going to matter because you're going to take absolute values at the end of the day. So it actually doesn't matter whether you put them in or not. So. Every time you use the ratio test, I actually leave that out, but I'm just following the strict definition here, so I, I put them in. Um, here's something that I do sometimes, uh, is to group like terms. And I would require this as optional, but recommended. Okay, what do I mean by group-like terms here? Well, we're going to have a bunch of things all over the place, and ultimately we're going to want to simplify this before actually taking the limit. So what I like to do is, especially when things get very complicated, is to group similar things together in the sense that the minus 1 to the n plus 1 is very similar to the minus 1 to the n in the denominator. Um, the n plus 1 is a polynomial, and there is an n in the denominator. Also, I have 2 to the n over 2 to the n plus 1. So I group the negative signs, I group the polynomials, and I group the exponentials. Okay? 
Now, strictly speaking, that's not necessary, but especially for students whose algebra skills aren't up to par, they, it's easy to get confused. So it's nice to delineate everything, leave everything separate. You can see things that are canceling easier. Now, what's going to happen here is that you'll notice things start canceling out. Let's see here. So what starts happening here is that this guy cancels that. This guy cancels with that. So I end up looking like the limit of minus n plus 1 over 2n is what that ends up looking like. Now, that limit is, that's right, it's a half, which is a very special number. Why is that number special? Well, because it's less than 1. Which means the series converges. In fact, it converges absolutely. Which is good. The series converges absolutely. which is nicer than using the alternating series test for the reason that the alternating series test actually only tells you about conditional convergence. So for a guy like this, especially in a certain context, you would definitely opt for the ratio test uh, or something similar um, for this situation. Um, yeah, that's an example. So if you did this with the alternating series test, it's fine. Uh, you should know that using the ratio test is better. And if you did the ratio test, uh, chance, hopefully your, your solution looks similar to that. So I'll give you some more time to copy that down. Pause the video. Three, two, one, and okay. So that's the ratio test. Okay, so if you haven't tried this one, pause the video, try it. Three, two, one, pause. Okay, hopefully you pause it, hopefully you tried it. Now, um, did you find that this converged or diverged? So let me tell you the best way to approach this is to notice that the limit of n factorial over e to the n is equal to infinity. Specifically, it's not zero. This means series diverges by test for divergence. 
Now, once something diverges by the test for diverges, then it diverges, right? There's no saving it. You, there's no, oh, maybe it might converge by conditionally or no, it's, it's gone, right? Test for diverge, once your limit does not equal to zero, you diverge. There is no hope for convergence for you, right? So the best way to actually approach this problem was to actually use the test for divergence. Now, if some of you saw this, good job. That's the way you should approach this problem. If had you seen it on a test or a quiz in whatever, whatever variation that's gonna look like now that we don't have in-person classes anymore. That, that's, a, that's a whole other thing that we haven't decided on yet, like as a department. How are we gonna test kids if we have to do it long distance? So I'll keep you guys posted on that. But if this showed up on a test or a quiz, uh, which as of this moment, those are both suspended, um, this is actually the best way to actually approach this problem. So, um, yeah. However, I'm going to go through the motions of doing it the ratio test way anyway, because there's something that I actually do want uh, you to see that can happen here. Um, so let's actually do it by the ratio test anyway. Anyway, by ratio test. What we can do is we can set L equals limit of a n plus 1 over a n. This is going to be the limit. Now, we saw last time that me throwing in the minus 1 to the n into this equation actually, yeah, it gave me a negative sign at the end, but then I take absolute value, so it doesn't actually matter. I didn't need the, the negative sign. So I'm actually going to ignore it here. So this is going to be n plus 1 factorial over the n plus 1, then I'm going to multiply that by e to the n. Now, I want to group these guys, so this is n plus 1 factorial over n factorial, e to the n over e to the n plus 1. Okay, so pause the video and tell me uh, what do you think that's going to end up being? It turns out that n plus 1 factorial is actually the same as n plus 1 times n factorial. We will come back to that. Um, some of you might have noticed that, some of you might not have. Uh, I'll actually talk about that in a little bit. But that means I can cancel this with that. Also, I can cancel this with that. So pretty much this leaves me with the limit of n plus 1 over e. Now, of course, that's infinity. What's special about infinity? It's definitely larger than 0. Uh, not larger than 0, larger than 1. series divergence, which of course we knew that from the test for divergence, but this is just another way to look at it. Now, why did I decide to show you the ratio test way even though the test for divergence was a much easier way? Well, it was an excuse for me to show you this particular kind of simplification, the one by the blue double star. It turns out that the ratio test is a very convenient test to use if you have factorials involved. And this is going to be something that we're going to go over next time. When to use which test, when are certain tests more suited for what you're looking at than others. The ratio test is very nice to use factorials because larger factorials include smaller ones. So let me actually talk about why is that the case. So let's talk about the double star. If you
you look at n plus 1 factorial, by our definition, what did that actually mean? Well, it was n plus 1 times n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times dot dot dot. You multiply all integers going down 3, 2, 1, right? So it's the product of all integers from 1 leading up to the number, right? What you're going to notice is that if you wrote that out, n plus 1 factorial includes n factorial. See, from n multiplying downwards to 1 is actually n factorial. So n plus 1 factorial is actually just n plus 1 times n factorial. So it turns out that every factorial will automatically include all smaller factorials. And this is very nice when you take them in a ratio. You can cancel out a lot of stuff. So um, you'll see something like 5 factorial. You can think of this as 5 times 4 factorial. You can also think of it as 5 times 4 times 3 factorial. You can think of it as 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 factorial, and so on and so forth. 5 factorial would include all lower factorials. Right? This is the same as 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 factorial. It's also the same as 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 times 0 factorial, where we know that 0 factorial is 1 by convention, but that's the lowest factorial for our purposes. In other math classes, you will actually can go lower than that. Right? But factorials will always include all higher, lower factorials. So that means that if you have a larger factorial, you can essentially use it if it's in the different, if it's in the numerator when the other one's in the denominator and vice versa, you can use larger factorials to cancel smaller ones. That makes the ratio test very useful when it comes to factorials. And this is something that I'll write down specifically uh, pretty soon. Um, here's another example uh, because Someone asked a question about this, and uh, I gave this other example in class. What if you had something like, uh, you guys can try this. Uh, minus 1 to the n over, say, 2n plus 1 factorial. So you have something like that. Um, here, you could actually apply the ratio test here. How much time do we have left? Not a lot. What we can do is apply the ratio test. Your L would be the limit of 1 over. Now, you have to replace all n's with n plus 1's. means down here you actually have 2n plus 3 factorial, right? Notice that this is a larger factorial than that one. Um, it would also stand to reason that this guy has a, will include that guy. How so? Well, if you start writing out what the 2 of n plus 3 factorial is, it just means you keep subtracting 1 and multiplying until you get all the way down to 1. So it starts out with 2n plus 3, then you're going to multiply by 2n plus 2, then you're going to multiply by 2n plus 1, and you'll keep doing that going down to 1. But if you do that, you're just going to be writing out the rest of the terms in 2n plus 1 factorial. This means on the top here, I have 2n plus 1 factorial, this guy is going to cancel with that guy. Now that allows for a very nice simplification here. This means that you have the limit of what this ends up being is 1 over 2n plus 3 times 2n plus 2. So having the ratio of factorials was actually pretty convenient. Um, so what actually happens now is you know what happens now. That limit does what? 
it approaches a zero, which is a less than one. The series converges absolutely. Now, I wanted to show this example because it goes to show you that it might take several steps. You might have to go through several steps for the, uh, the factorials to actually cancel out. But uh, if one is in the numerator, one is in the denominator, one is a larger factorial than the other, there will be a cancellation happening at some point. Um, and so you can actually take advantage of that. So the ratio test is very, uh, very nice in that regard. Ratio test. Uh, so let me actually write that down. And I, I'll actually say this again. I'll repeat this in the next lecture. That's just something to consider. You have a series, and it has factorials in it. Then, based on the situation, if the test for divergence doesn't tell you otherwise, a ratio test is a nice test to use, actually. This leads us to second to last test, uh, the root test, so this is just number nine. The root test. So I'm going to tell you about the root test. I'm going to leave you with an example to try for next time. Um, and we'll kind of wrap up there because we're actually almost out of time. So another test that you should know about is the root test. This applies to any series. Basically, you are going to set up another limit. Here is uh, how you're going to actually set up this limit. You're actually going to take the nth root of the absolute value of a n. That's what you're going to do. You're going to compute that limit. Now, some of you might already see why that might be convenient, depending on your situation, taking the nth root of something. But that's the guy you set up. And here are some conclusions. If L is less than 1, the series converges. Not only does it converge, but it converges absolutely. The conclusion looked all pretty much exactly the same as the, the, the ratio test, actually. The series diverges if this limit is greater than 1. And if L equals 1, no conclusion. Um, there are some important remarks to make here about the root test before I leave you with that example. Um, and I'll also be making remarks about the ratio test at the same time. 
Uh, one. The ratio and root test. give similar conclusions. What do I mean by that? Let's say you did a ratio test and you ended up with the limit equals one, right? Which means that according to the ratio test, it's inconclusive. You can't use the ratio test to do anything. If you were to try the root test on that same series, it turns out that the root test would also give you a limit of one. Um, whenever the ratio test gives you a limit less than one, the root test will give you a limit less than one. Whenever the ratio test gives you a limit greater than one, the root test will give you a limit greater than one. Now, one of these tests might be easier to apply than the other, but aside from those nuances, the conclusion is going to be the same. This means you'll never actually use both of these tests in conjunction with a series. Now, there might be other series out there where you have to use several tests on them, where Oh, I tried this test, but it didn't really work out. Let me try this test. No, it didn't really work out. Let me try this test, right? Now, with experience, you'll make less trial and error. However, you should just know if you jump in with the ratio test or the root test and you get an inconclusive result, then you do not want to try using the other one, right? So if the ratio test fails, the root test is going to fail. And if the root test fails, the ratio test is going to fail. So if you jump in with one of them, and it doesn't give you a result that's conclusive, using the other one is actually not going to be useful at all. So that is a new, very important remark. So if you're going to use the ratio or the root test, you're only going to use one of the two. You'll never use both because they'll both give you the same conclusion. So that's something that's important. Secondly, what's important is, uh, when is the root test going to be If your sequence is just some other sequence raised to an nth power, or maybe even some constant to the nth power, you taking the nth root of something that looks like that will get rid of this, and then limits, we know how limits behave, you can take the limit on the inside, it'll make it much easier to actually find the limit. So the, ratio, the root test is actually pretty convenient in, in the case that you have exponentials, right? Especially exponentials of this form. Um, so the root test is convenient. Uh, it's probably going to be one of the go-to tests. If you just see something raised to the nth power, it's very nice. There are exceptions to this rule. Uh, both the ratio and the root test here, actually. This is a criticism of both. They are useless if a n is a rational function. It turns out that if you have a series that is a rational function, um, you are going to get uh, an inconclusive result, whether you use the ratio test or the root test. So uh, the ratio test is easier to see this because notice what's going to happen. If you, replace, if you take the ratio a n plus 1 over a n, well, you're just taking a polynomial. You're replacing all n's with n plus 1's. The degree is not going to change. So you're going to have a ratio of polynomials where the degree is the same on the top and the bottom. And we know that that just reduces to the ratio of their coefficients. But the coefficients are going to be the same also. The coefficients are just going to cancel and give you 1. So the ratio test will be inconclusive if you have a rational function. Try it with a harmonic series. That's a good exercise. Uh, you'll notice that the ratio test is inconclusive with a harmonic series. You'll get a ratio of one. Uh, the limit will be one. So if you have a rational function, the ratio or the root test is not going to be the guy that you want to try. So yeah, just don't try them. Um, that's all there is to say about that. Uh, Here's an example that I want you to try for the root test. Um, there's a little nice guide to the nth power, kind of hints to you that you want to use the root
to test on a guy like that. Now, I, I wouldn't particularly use the ratio test, even though I, I wouldn't even try. You potentially could. I, uh, that's going to be a lot messier. It's much nicer to just take the nth root of this, get rid of that power, and then take the limit. Um, so I would say try that for next time. And next time, I'm going to tell you about one more test, which isn't really a test, actually, but all textbooks treat it as if it were a test. I don't, I don't know why they do that. Um, but I'll talk about that. I'll also talk about just a kind of summary, a strategy, if you will, on how you want to approach this series thing. Um, we're pretty much wrapped up with the series test segment. So series were very important. These were the sums of sequences. And we want to know when they actually add up to something that's meaningful. And the series tests are actually going to help us with that. And so we've done uh, 10 of them at this point. Uh, I'll give you an 11th one that's kind of a test, but not really. And we'll wrap up with this convergence test at that point and move on to some uh, interesting things. And I'll also give you some examples. Oh, maybe, maybe I'll do that as well. Leave you with some more examples for you to try for the next lecture. Uh, so what I want to do is tell me, do these converge uh, absolutely, converge conditionally, or diverge. Okay, so try what we've learned uh, with all these examples. So you're going to do this example, then you're going to do these guys, and you're going to wait for that next lecture. So cosine squared n plus 1 over n squared plus 1. Minus 1 to the n cosine of n factorial over n raised to the nth power. Minus 1 to the n of n over n plus 1 to the n. Minus 1 to the n over ln of the square root of n plus 1. So try these random examples. Um, see how much trial and error you had to do to actually figure out how to get to those. Uh, next time, I'll talk about a general strategy for approaching series. I'll talk about another one last series test. And then we'll go through these examples and maybe talk about some other stuff. At the moment, we're actually over time. but. Let's stop there. This is Javon signing out. I'm really tired. I need to go home and get some rest. And I'm going to disinfect everything before I get out of here. So I'm taking this very seriously. Um, so try those. I will catch up with you guys in the next one. Like I said, if you have questions, leave them down in the comment section. And, uh, or shoot me a message through uh, Jupiter grades, and I'll actually address those questions. Also going to try to get that Blackboard Collaboration Ultra thing to work again tomorrow, probably from a different location. And you might realize that if you're in the G8 section, I'm not in the usual classroom. Um, I'm actually in the classroom for my other class, because I, the board is nice here. It's a lot more stable. I'll catch up with you guys in the next one. and. Yeah, that's it. Peace. Stay safe. Be healthy out there.